Good evening, my name is Sophie and the next presentation is going to be about polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, it is a very common, it's the most common endocrine disorder in women of the reproductive age group um, with an incidence reported between 6 and 21 percent here in Australia. It's associated with a significant healthcare cost up to 400 million per year. And it's still a poorly understood condition. Um, there are genetic predisposing factors and there are lifestyle problems that when, um, to get, when they come together, they can cause hormonal changes that are exacerbated by obesity. The hormonal changes mainly involve an increase in androgens and an increase in insulin. And those hormonal changes in turn will um, lead to an increased number of ovarian follicles and anovulation. And so polycystic ovarian syndrome has a number of direct symptoms related to um, these um, changes and these are often the presenting symptoms for which the patient will come and see you. The increase in androgens can lead to hirsutism and acne um, and the um, anovulation or oligoovulation can lead to menstrual disturbances, so irregular cycles, usually longer than 35 days and possibly also subfertility because of it. But there are also some more long-term health effects associated with polycystic ovarian syndrome, making it an important syndrome. So diabetes metabolic syndrome and therefore an increased risk of cardiovascular risk, um, but, um, but also endometrial cancer because of the menstrual disturbances, particularly if cycles are very long and the endometrium becomes very thick between periods. And there are a psychosocial, an increased risk of psychosocial um, problems such as low self-esteem, depression and anxiety. So because it is an important syndrome, it is important to make an, a correct diagnosis. And there has been some confusion lately about um, particularly relating to the ultrasound criteria in the diagnosis of polycystic ovarian syndrome. So since 2003, we have used the ESHRE um, ASRM um, Rotterdam diagnostic criteria. Um, they require two out of three criteria to be present to make a diagnosis of polycystic ovarian syndrome. So oligoovulation or anovulation as one. Number two is clinical or biochemical hyperandrogenism. And then the third one is polycystic ovaries, and they define polycystic ovaries as <clears throat> an ovarian volume more than 10 cc or more than 12 follicles in one ovary. That was obviously, you needed two out of three to make a diagnosis of polycystic ovarian syndrome, but only after excluding other causes of anovulation and hyperandrogenism. So I just wanted to represent this visually because there will be a lot of women who have polycystic ovaries on ultrasound, um, but that are not overlapping with either oligoovulation or hyperandrogenism. And there are lots of women who may have anovulation for other reasons. Um, so, um, and the same goes for hyperandrogenism. So it's really only where those circles overlap that you can make a diagnosis of um, polycystic ovarian syndrome. One of those criteria by itself is not enough. So in a normal ovary, a follicle will grow um, sort of and go through stages of maturation, eventually leading to ovulation, like here on the left. The hormonal changes associated with polycystic ovarian syndrome lead to that sort of maturation process to not happen normally and the development of the follicle is sort of stopped and therefore there are multiple immature follicles present in the ovary but they are follicles, they are not cysts and so polycystic ovaries is sort of not the best name because those um, um, cysts all contain an egg if you're going to stimulate those ovaries for say IVF or ovulation induction, um, you will um, um, pick up an oocyte out of um, all of those, or those women will also very easily hyperstimulate. The number of normal follicles can also vary um, with age. Um, much, many more um, follicles in young women compared to older women, and also with oral contraceptive pill use. So we can't see the difference between those little cysts in polycystic ovaries and normal follicles. So we need to have some guideline as to how many follicles is normal in an ovary. 
And so um, when we are going to um, assess an ovary, we scan through the ovary like we do here. This is the, um, the ovary. And you'll see that there are lots of little black spaces in the ovary. Those are the follicles. So as we scan through the ovary from left to right, um, we are going to count in our head how many follicles we can count. And so according to the Rotterdam criteria, once we count 12 follicles, the ovary has a polycystic appearance. Now, this is one of the very few articles that um, has put the number of follicles in women that do not have polycystic ovarian syndrome on a chart according to age and according to percentile. So this is the, um, the third percentile down here and the 97th percentile down here, with the 50th percentile being the purple line. Um, you can see that the number of follicles gradually goes down, probably to the age of 35, and then slightly more steeply going down. Now, if we put 12 as a cutoff for polycystic ovaries, you can see what, pro what problems that gives. Because if we do an ultrasound pretty much on any teenager under 20, they, um, these are all women that do not have polycystic ovarian syndrome, they will almost invariably have more than 12 follicles and they will be classified as having polycystic ovaries. We call that polycystic ovarian morphology um, as opposed to polycystic ovarian syndrome for which you need another criterion present. If we look um, even sort of up to the age of mid-30s, where it crosses the 50th percentile, 50% of women will have ovaries that have more than 12 follicles. And so we then put the word polycystic ovaries in the ultrasound report, and it causes a lot of unnecessary anxiety and preoccupation with those cysts. Women often ask for a, um, a repeat scan to assess the cyst, and 50% of women think that the cysts are a key finding. But the cysts really are follicles, and the ovaries are multifollicular, and finding them doesn't mean that they necessarily have polycystic ovarian syndrome. But when they read the word polycystic, often patients will go to Dr. Google, and they find images like this, and they um, panic. So it's not surprising that the Androgen Access and PCOS um, Task Force published an article in Human Reproduction in 2013, and they suggested that the diagnostic criteria for PCOS should be changed. They um, still agreed that two out of three criteria needed to be present. Oligo or anovulation and clinical or biochemical hyperandrogenism remained the same, but the third criteria, polycystic ovaries on ultrasound, they suggested to change the threshold for the number of follicles to 25 follicles. That was then repeated in an opinion piece in the Ultrasound Journal, the International Society of Ultrasound in ONG in 2014. They agreed that polycystic ovaries is a poor name. Um, they suggested that when we report follicles, that only in women with a menstrual disorder with a threshold of 25 follicles, we should call the ovary polycystic. In asymptomatic women, they suggested that we should call the ovary normal, regardless of the number of follicles. But it's not very practical here in Australia, because obviously that would be okay in a practice like ours, where we spend five minutes talking to a patient about her symptoms. We ask a lot of questions because we want to be able to refer back to the original symptoms when we make a conclusion about the findings. Um, but if those questions are not asked and the reporting radiologist is not aware of um, the menstrual difficulty, um, then it is difficult um, to make a sensible um, um, comment regarding the normality of um, the finding and therefore we need sort of a threshold and, and so the suggestion was to use 25 follicles. But if we put 25 follicles on the chart, you can see that almost no one who does not have polycystic ovarian syndrome will now have polycystic ovaries on ultrasound. But you can see that that might cause other problems. And indeed, in Fertility and Sterility in 2016, there was this article published that suggested that by changing the threshold to 25 follicles, um, we might be under-diagnosing women with polycystic ovarian syndrome and women um, might need metabolic surveillance and may miss out because of this change in threshold. So I believe the jury is still out. Some practices will use the Rotterdam criteria and report 12 follicles. Other practices have changed to 25 follicles. You will see that um, 
if you look up currently the GP um, college website, even the um, ONG college website or um, Jean Hales, um, where you can find a lot of information about um, polycystic ovaries, in all their documents they will still recommend the Rotterdam um, criteria as a diagnostic criteria. In 2011 there were guidelines written for um, Australia that were evidence-based um, for the uh, management of polycystic ovarian syndrome and those have not been officially revised and they still recommend the Rotterdam criteria. However, since that publication um, about changing the threshold to 25, a lot of ultrasound practitioners, like ourselves, are keen to change um, because we, we realize that we often cause harm by um, calling too many ovaries polycystic, um, but currently there is a little bit um, of uncertainty yet which um, criteria to use, and you as referring GPs, um, you will um, find that sometimes you may um, get a diagnosis of polycystic ovaries based on 12 follicles and other times on 25 follicles or even more confusing, someone may have had an ultrasound and was told that she had polycystic ovaries and then she comes for a second opinion and we use a different um, threshold and suddenly she does not have polycystic ovaries. But I think the main thing to remember is why there is this confusion and also that polycystic ovaries on themselves are not a diagnosis of polycystic ovarian syndrome. You need something else, one of the other two criteria. So I don't want to say too much about the management of polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, sort of the presenting symptoms, the irregular periods, the hirsutism and the acne, um, here in the corner, they're often managed by oral contraceptive pill. The oral contraceptive pill will um, reduce your free testosterone by increasing the sex hormone bineoglobulin and, um, and therefore it will reduce symptoms like hirsutism and acne, but it will also regulate periods. So it will make a polycystic ovarian syndrome patient asymptomatic. Um, it is important in the management of patients not to lose um, sight of the long-term complications. Um, so look after psychological well-being as well as diabetes risk um, um, by performing um, a semi-regular or GTT, um, cardiovascular risk by um, um, following up blood pressure profile and lipid profile. And if there is abnormal bleeding, um, realizing that even in younger women um, endometrial cancer is a possible diagnosis and therefore being probably a little bit more vigilant in the investigation of abnormal bleeding. But I just want to spend a few words talking about fertility because particularly because a lot of women who hear the word polycystic ovaries in their ultrasound report start assuming they have polycystic ovarian syndrome whilst they may not have it and the only thing they fear is infertility. But even if people do have polycystic ovarian syndrome, I think it is important um, to give a balanced view on fertility because some women believe that they cannot fall pregnant and they become careless with contraception when there is really no wish yet for a pregnancy and they may find themselves pregnant before they realize it. Um, and also making it clear to patients that predicting fertility is impossible. Um, it depends on the length of your cycle and the regularity of your cycle when um, you are trying to conceive. If there is some regularity to the cycle and it's clear when you should try um, to fall pregnant, then it's easier than when you have random and very irregular periods. So there will be many women who have no trouble and that's important to point out because there's no point in worrying about something that may not happen for 10 years um, and then when the 10 years are up and you try to conceive there is no problem. But if there is difficulty conceiving, um, it's usually obviously to do with anovulation and a referral to a fertility specialist is appropriate for treatment with clomid, metformin, gonadotropins or ovarian drilling. I think the main thing to discuss with patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome that are diagnosed when they're not ready to have a baby yet and may not be ready for m numerous years before they go on the pill is to explain to them that it's mainly a BMI over 30 that limits their fertility. And women with polycystic ovarian syndrome tend to put on more weight. They may put on a kilo or a kilo and a half um, every year. 
and their weight may already be a little bit problematic when they go on a pill when their um, syndrome is diagnosed but 10 years later when they want to conceive and they go off the pill they may be much heavier and their periods may be much less regular than they were when it was initially diagnosed so I think stressing the fact of a healthy lifestyle and even if there's not um, an easy sort of weight loss maybe then at least preventing weight gain further weight gain um, is important so in conclusion it's important to realize that PCO is not the same as PCOS um, so always when you re uh, receive a report that says the ovaries look polycystic, ask yourself what was the reason for the scan? Was it hyperandrogenism? Was it oligomenorrhea or subfertility? Because no one else needs an incidental finding of PCO, and so two out of three criteria are necessary um, to make a diagnosis. And for the next few years, there may still be some confusion until the updated guidelines for Australia are um, published, whether we should use 12 or 25 follicles, but it looks like it may become 25 follicles, and some practices have certainly started using that. Um, be careful with adolescents. Adolescents have numerous follicles, that is normal, um, because they're young. Acne is common in adolescents, and irregular cycles are common. So if a diagnosis needs to be made at all, then I think it needs to be a specialist diagnosis by an endocrinologist at that time. Realize that on the pill, your sex hormone binding globulin will increase and therefore your free testosterone will decrease. And uh, the pill reduces also the number of follicles and regulates the periods. So all the different symptoms and markers of a polycystic ovarian syndrome will improve and therefore when you're on the pill it's not really easy to assess um, polycystic ovarian syndrome and you need to be off the pill for about three months to be able to um, do a reliable assessment but I guess if there was once a diagnosis of polycystic ovarian syndrome then it's not really necessary to follow it up whilst the patient is on the pill as I said um, it's mainly important that they watch their weight and try and have a healthy lifestyle and um, and then the situation can be reassessed when they're ready to go off the pill and start a family because repeat ultrasounds to follow up the cysts are not useful and so in counseling um, be careful with counseling regarding fertility um, probably the best advice is to stop the pill a bit ahead of time to see what cycles are doing and stress the importance of lifestyle adjustment, some weight loss, or in any case, prevent weight gain. Thank you for your attention.